In this video, we're going to introduce derivatives and vector functions. So let's suppose that we have a vector function whose component functions are f, g, and j. Then we can define the derivative of that vector function. We'll use the same notation like we do in Calc 1. We can use the Leibniz notation dr dt or the prime notation f prime of t, excuse me, r prime of t. We'll just denote that we're doing a derivative of a vector valued function by using that bold face r here in this case. We'll do, define it as a limit of, of the difference quotient, so we'll have limit as h goes to 0 of r of t plus h minus r of t all over h. We can write this in terms of how r is defined as its component function, so this would be the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h times the quantity of f of t plus h, g of t plus h, j of t plus h for its first vector, minus f of t, g of t, j of t for the second vector. But well, we know that when we subtract vectors, we do it component-wise, and then we can distribute the scalar to each component. We can rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient for f, difference quotient for g, and difference quotient for j as the three components of the vector. We know that we can take limits of vector-valued functions by doing the limits of each of the components. So the components now of the vector are the limit of the, each of the difference quotients in each component. And now we recognize that this is exactly how the derivative is defined for real-valued functions. So each of those components must be f prime of t, g prime of t, and j prime of t, provided, of course, that all three of the limits exist. So this is exactly how we're going to do derivatives of vector-valued functions. We'll do it component-wise. So let's do a quick example. If your vector-valued function is the function 1 over ti plus e to the tj minus cosine of 2tk, the derivative is going to be, well, this is the same thing as 1 plus t to the negative 1, so we'll get a negative 1 plus t to the negative 2, or a negative 1 over the quantity 1 plus t squared times i. Derivative of e to the t is just itself, so we'll get an e to the tj. And then derivative of cosine 2t is a negative 2 sine 2t, so that flips the sine to a plus for the third component, so we'll get a plus 2 sine 2tk. Uh, one of the vectors that we're going to be interested in as we go forward is going to be what we refer to as the unit tangent vector. So we can think of the derivative as giving us a tangent direction to a curve, and we want to know, in some sense, a unit in that direction, a unit vector in that direction. So the derivative, the r prime of t, will give us the direction of the tangent vector, and then we'll divide out by its magnitude to get a unit vector. So the magnitude of t of t will always be 1. Uh, of course, provided that r prime of a, a t value is not equal to 0, and then we can't do this quotient. So in the previous example, if we want the unit tangent vector when t equals 0, we have the derivative. We can plug in the 0 for the t everywhere and get the vector negative i plus j. The magnitude of that vector will be square root of 2. So the unit tangent vector at 0 will be 1 over root 2 times the quantity negative i plus j. So to give a little bit of a picture of everything that's been going on in terms of derivatives and in terms of this unit tangent vector. So let's say we have the position vector. R. Here's a space curve that's drawn out by r of t in this particular example. This would be the graph. R of 0, of course, is the vector that goes from the origin out to the curve at that point. Say I plugged in something like R of 1 half. This would be the position vector at R of 1 half. If we do R of 1 half minus R of 0 and divide it by a half, we get this red vector here. And so we see kind of a secant direction vector, if you will, between those two points. If we imagine taking this one half and making it get closer and closer and closer to zero, this red vector approaches this black vector to give us the r prime of zero here. And we notice that that really does look like it's tangent to our space curve in this case. Now the black vector is tangent to the curve but may not have length one, 
So when we divide the length by root 2, we get a tangent vector of length 1, and that's what the t of 0 is, and that's what that green vector is in the picture. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, the derivative of a vector valued function can give us the direction for the tangent line. So let's say we're asked to find parametric equations of that tangent line when t is equal to 0 for the same example curve that we've been working with. So we need a point and a direction to be able to figure out the equation of the line. Well, the point will be given to us by plugging in 0 into the original function. When we do that, we get the vector i, j, k. We've already seen that when we plug 0 into the derivative, we get negative i plus j. So here is our vector that will give us the point, and here is our vector that gives us the direction. So now when we do parametric equations for the tangent line, we'll get 1 minus t for x, 1 plus t for y, and then just a negative 1 for z. And here now we can see the green vector here is giving us the vector r prime of 0. I know I used green for the tangent vector in the previous slide, but this is the r prime of 0. And then this is the line that's following that direction as its direction vector and is tangent to the curve. Let's talk about some differentiation rules for derivatives of vector valued functions. So let's suppose that r and s are both differentiable vector value functions and that f is a real valued function and that c is some constant. Well, these derivative rules are going to follow along like our derivatives rules did back in Calc 1. Derivatives play nicely with respect to sums and differences. Derivatives play nicely with respect to constant multiples. We can just take the constant and pull it outside the derivative. So the first property here says the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives the and a difference. The second, deriv uh, the second property says the derivative of a constant times a function is a constant times the derivative. The third one is a product rule for scalar functions times vector functions. So if I have the scalar function f of t and the vector valued function r of t, I still do this as a product rule. The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Well, a product rule also follows along with our vector products that we have. So if we want to do the derivative of the dot product of two functions, well, it follows the same type of product rule. It's the first derivative of the first function dotted with the second, and then the first function dotted with the derivative of the second. We also get a product rule that looks like the uh, product rule for cross products. So we have the derivative of the cross product of R and S will be the derivative of the first cross the second plus the first cross the derivative of the second. And we also get what looks like a chain rule here. We've got the derivative of r of f of t. We have to, of course, do the vector of the scalar function. We can't go the other way around because this is a scalar function, meaning we plug in a scalar, get out a scalar. I remember for vector functions, you plug in a scalar and get out a vector. So I could not do this composition the other way around. But when we do this, it does look like a chain rule. We get the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the inside function time is the derivative of the inside function. We did differentiation component-wise for vector-valued functions. We get to do the exact same thing for integration. So let's look at the, uh, the example where we're being asked to evaluate the definite integral from 0 to 1 of t squared i minus pi over 6 secant squared of pi t over 6 j plus 1 over 1 plus t squared k. Well, we can rewrite this as the integral from 0 to 1 of t squared times the i minus the integral from 0 to 1 of the pi over 6 secant squared of pi t over 6 dt times the j, and then the integral of the 1 over 1 plus t squared dt times k. We can do each of those integrals. Antiderivative for t squared is 1 over 1 third t cubed. We'll evaluate that from 0 to 1. Antiderivative of this more complicated expression, I suppose, uh, is just tangent of pi t over 6, and antiderivative for 1 over 1 plus t squared is just inverse tangent of t. And again, all three of these antiderivatives will be evaluated from 0 to 1. When we plug in 1 for 1 third t cubed, we get a third. When we plug in 0, we get 0. So we get a 1 third i. Plugging in 1 for t here, we get tangent of pi over 6, which is root 3 over 3. 
Plugging in zero, we get zero. So we get a minus root three over three j. When we plug in one for inverse tangent, we get pi over four. When we plug in zero, we get zero. So we get a plus pi over four k. If instead of a definite integral, we were asked to compute an indefinite integral, we would attack it just like we do for uh, real valued functions where we write an arbitrary constant. It's just in this case, our arbitrary constant would be a vector rather than a constant scalar. So we would just write it as a vector form at the end. So we would have one third t cubed i minus tangent of pi t over 6j plus inverse tangent t k plus a constant vector c.